Welcome to the Artful Engineer episode 8. My name is Junko Yoshida. We've got Michael Kass, a world-class competitor in ballroom dancing, ice skating. He's also a unicyclist and juggler. Plus, he is a photographer, actually. To top it off, though, uh, Michael is a senior distinguished distinguished engineer at NVIDIA. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the show. Hi, very nice to be here. I want to hear about your engineering career. But before we get to that, I want to ask you questions about what do you do when you're not doing engineering? Let's start from there. Sure. I mean, I have a, a, a lot of hobbies and I, I generally take them pretty seriously. So. Um, the way I started juggling was kind of interesting. My dad was reading the New York Times and there happened to be an article that said that anyone could learn how to juggle in a week or two. So I, I, I read the little article and I went in the backyard and I started tossing the crab apples up and down until I figured out how to do it. I found out about the International Juggling Association. So I went to the first uh, convention that was in, in Delaware actually. Um, had a fantastic time, saw all these crazy jugglers doing crazy things and went home and practiced as, as hard as I could. And uh, a few years later, I won the US championship. Fast forward, now you are adult, right? And you suddenly decided to pick up ballroom dancing and ice dancing. What prompted you to actually even want to do ballroom dancing? When I was a kid, um, my, my mom was always watching ice skating. One year, the national champ championship was near where my aunt lived. So my mom went and, uh, and she watched it and she had a great time. She wanted to watch it the following year. So I hadn't spent time with my mom for a while. Um, and I said, sure, you know, um, I'll, I'll go with you. So I went with her and I watched skating, skating, more skating, more skating, you know, and, and I thought, you know, that looks like too much fun. Um, I'd like to do it. So I walked into the nearest ice rink and, and I said, teach me to skate, you know, and they put me in a, an adult class and um, I saw a couple, I really liked the way they were skating and um, I saw a coach working with them and I liked the way he was working with them. So, so I went up to him after and um, asked him if he was available to, to teach me. And I, I guess it turns out I had good taste because he was a, a three-time Canadian national champion and fifth in the 1980 Olympics. And it turns out I was lucky at times. How old were you when you started actually taking lessons from this world champion? I was in my 30s. Wow. So ice dancing actually um, the ex extended to the ballroom dancing. Is that it? Ice dancing is kind of a crazy thing. Um, and there aren't that many adults that do it very seriously. So um, I had some partners for, for a number of years and then um, spent many years looking for a partner without success. Uh, eventually I got tired of not having a, a partner for, um, for ice dancing. And uh, I'd, I'd always wanted to get into ballroom dance because ice dancing is essentially ballroom dance on ice. I've had the opportunity to um, work with a very, very uh, skilled uh, coach who fortunately is, is in the local area. So you actually went to this uh, very famous um, England uh, uh, ballroom dancing competition. What does it? What? What? What is it called? Uh, Blackpool. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, after doing it for I guess a little over two years, went to the um, Blackpool Pro Am uh, competition. That was really a big deal, right? To actually compete in that. Um, how did you do? Came in uh, third. Because this is, you know, let's keep it in perspective. This is the, uh, dancing with my instructor. This is not um, the same as the, the open, you know, professional. And I'd like to talk about Michael when he was 14 years old. This is my favorite story because um, this is close to my heart. You know, you imagine if I'm a reporter and covering some conference, technical conference, and I bump into 14 year old five foot tall kid asking questions in front of engineers from Intel, National, Fairchild, Motorola, 
RCA, right? So tell me, this was the, uh, what was the name of the conference? Philadelphia Electronics Conference? The Cleveland, Cleveland Electronics Conference, yeah. Oh, Cleveland. And this was in 1970s or 80s? Uh, yeah, somewhere around there. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, um, I was um, yeah, building my own computer at the time, designing it out of TTL. So I was at this conference and there was a, you know, uh, presentation with an audience of you know, a few hundred. One of the semiconductor salespeople made claims for the product that were that were obviously false. Um, so I got up to the microphone and I um, I asked a, a set of questions that basically made it clear to everybody that um, the sales person didn't actually understand his chip. You went to Princeton, MIT, Stanford. How did you decide what to study? And what was the research field that you are in? I started off planning to become a physics major at Princeton. Eventually, I realized that all the easy problems in, in physics were solved a long time ago, and also all the medium hard problems and the hard problems. Then so, some friends of mine were um, interested in artificial intelligence, and they had started a, a student-initiated seminar in artificial intelligence, which I decided to take. And there were great... Um, lectures uh, from, from people from other places. At the time, there was no uh, artificial intelligence research going on at, at Princeton. One of them gave a lecture on computer vision, which I found really fascinating. And at the time, I was taking an image processing class. So I, I implemented the idea that the professor described in the visiting lecture and um, came up with some refinements. And then I, I sent that to the to the professor, and um, that led to uh, a summer job at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. After that, I went to MIT for um, for grad school. Mm -hmm. So I um, did my master's in computer vision at the AI lab. I had a I had a summer job uh, at uh, at the time it was Fairchild Fairchild's lab for AI research. It was called Flare. Was later bought by Schlumberger and became Schlumberger Palo Alto Research. So I, I had a summer job there, and and they didn't want me to go back to, um, uh, back to MIT. So they offered um, to pay my Stanford tuition if I finished, uh, you know, full salary plus Stanford tuition if I finished at, at Stanford. So that's sort of like a beginning of a career at in Silicon Valley, I guess. I mean, you are actually, actually you had a job at Schlumberger, and then you you moved on to Apple, Pixar, Magic Leap, Intel, and uh, NVIDIA. Is that right? That's right. Can you give us some highlights of uh, some of these companies that you work for? It's something that you, uh, you, you have really um, memorable moments. I was working at uh, uh, Schlumberger. Uh, my, my thesis research had, had moved from computer vision to uh, problems around the boundary between computer vision and graphics. And at the time, those two fields were completely separate. If you, if you look out at the, at the world and you understand it to some degree, then you can, you can change images in a, in a different way than um, traditionally. So in a, in a traditional dark room, you could, you could change exposure and, and uh, you know, oh, wow. you know, lightness of certain things and colors and, and whatever, but nothing that really understood the way the image was formed. But if you can look out at the world and not just see a bunch of pixels, but see the way that um, the light interacted with the scene and the way the image was formed, then you can p potentially model it and then ask questions uh, like, well, uh, what if this was different? And one, one thing that we, we did is we, we did a, a very early film called Not Real, which is, uh, we started with a picture of a piece of wood with a, a knot in the middle. And we tried to model, you know, how that could have come about and to see if we could extract from that picture a description that um, had something to do with with its genesis, you know, that, oh, we have these, these sort of grain lines and they're, they look like they're deformed by this knot. And um, so we were able to 
come up with a, a, a description of that deformation as a, as a coordinate system and then view the texture in that coordinate system and thereby remove the knots. So we made a, a, a fun little animation we showed at SIGGRAPH where we, um, you know, we, we took a knot out of a piece of wood and we had more knots in and it was all based on this um, computer vision approach. Computer graphics, it just really did work. Um, but there were still a lot of very, very interesting open problems, um, particularly in uh, simulation. That's that's where I, I started to um, do most of my work. Um, and so I started to uh, to do a lot of that work at at Apple, and then um, later on continued continued that um, for for 18 years at Pixar. Well, that gives me a perfect leeway um, picture thing. Um, because um, I remember you told me that when you were a kid, you actually built your own robot or you had the picture of you and your robot, right? And I think that's what every boy or every child has that ambition of, wouldn't that be nice to have my own robot, right? But you are one of the lucky ones actually got to uh, be a part of the creation of Wally, is it not? Well, I was at Pixar, we were working on a collaboration with Disney Imagineering to try to improve the quality of the robots at the um, Disney theme parks. Along the way, we um, there, there came this, this uh, opportunity um, around the film Wally. The marketing department, and they asked the question, well, you know, could, could Wally himself appear um, on talk shows, walk the red carpet and, and all this? You know, we said, well, actually, you know, if we have enough of uh, enough manpower, enough budget, we could probably pull something like that off. We ended up doing the full mechanical design for the robot from scratch and every layer of the software uh, from scratch. Essentially six months from when we started, we were doing uh, live performances in, in front of real audiences. What does a senior distinction engineer do at a company? And what is your hardest project that you are engaged in at NVIDIA today? Yeah, so I'm the overall software architect for Omniverse. So NVIDIA Omniverse is uh, our platform for um, collaboration in virtual worlds. Essentially, the idea with Omniverse there's a, a central uh, database that stores uh, a full description of the virtual world. And we do that with a USD universal scene description that comes from Pixar. Pixar was nice enough to open source it. Then we have a variety of uh, clients that speak to this database and they can be digital content creation tools. Uh, they can be renderers. They can be microservices. Essentially, this allows all of those tools, all of those visualization tools to um, combine together in and uh, access, modify, and uh, observe a single shared representation of a virtual world. So we, we sometimes uh, think of it a little bit as um, Google Docs for 3D that, uh, you know, there's this, instead of a, but instead of sharing a document, we're sharing a virtual world. And any of the participants using any of their favorite applications can uh, modify it. I'd like you to define the um, connection between art and engineering. I mean, one of the nice fun things about working at, at Pixar was the fact that the um, uh, there was so much interaction between the artists and the engineers. Um, you know, we. Uh, looked at what what they did as magic, and they looked at what, what we did as magic. But it was it was very much a collaboration. Um, you know, an artist may not even even know what to ask for. Uh, so it, having that understanding back and forth about what you're trying to accomplish and what are the problems whose solution would you know enable major progress. You know that that I think is one of the the nicest places where where art and and science have a, an opportunity to um, to meet. You know, one of the things that actually I was very impressed last time you and I talked was that when you said in a very um, upfront way, 
question go? There is no redlining between art and engineering. Tell me about that redlining, why there is no boundaries. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, some companies try to create a, a, a red line there, but every time there's an opportunity to, to make that line more porous, uh, I think that uh, the, the results are, are um, you know, have the opportunity to push the state of the art way beyond uh, what has been possible previously. So I mean, if you look back at, at uh, you know, Da Vinci, he was regularly crossing um, from technology to art and back and forth. So uh, I think I think technology and art have to have to inform each other. It's it's um, uh, it's it's the opportunity to to make really really big advances. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.